Hello, everybody. I'm Dominic Hobson, co-founder of Future of Finance. And welcome to our webinar, Fund Administration is Coming to a Jurisdiction Near You. Funds have certainly emerged as an early use case for tokenization. Why? Chiefly because the profitability of asset managers is being squeezed by a combination of uh, falling revenues and rising costs, particularly compliance costs. Asset managers have, over many years, automated, outsourced and offshored almost everything that they can. And to increase efficiency further, a growing group of them are convinced that a whole new operating model that can transform the costs of manufacturing, distributing and servicing funds is now necessary. And in principle, tokenization provides that. There are lots of other reasons why the idea of tokenizing funds is gaining momentum. Tokenized funds can help asset managers reach whole new classes of investor. Tokenized funds can also, as tokenization platforms around the world are proving already, offer previously institution-only investment strategies, such as private equity, real estate and commodities, to retail investors. Above all, by making use of smart contracts to automate asset servicing and the exercise of shareholder rights, and of course, decentralized autonomous organizations or DAOs, whose legal status is somewhat uncertain. But with those particular techniques, investors can be given stakes in management companies as well as in funds. So tokenized funds could reinvent the whole of shareholder capitalism for a new generation. So the possibilities inherent in the tokenization of funds are far reaching, they're profound, and they're rather exciting. To help us explore them, we're joined by four experts in the field. John Allen is a senior advisor, fund innovation and operations at the Investment Association, which he joined from BMO Global Asset Management in May 2019, after working in fund operations there and previously at BNY Mellon. Brian McNulty is a founder and CEO at FAC, Fund Admin Chain, a blockchain-based network for onboarding, distributing, trading and servicing funds in both traditional and digital forms, the origins of which lie in his work at R3 and DBFS, the consulting firm he co-founded in 2011. David Moffitt is a senior director at SS&C Global Investor and Distribution Solutions, where he leads business and proposition development, marketing and external affairs functions for SS&C fund services in the UK and Europe. Graham Rodford is founder and CEO of Archax, the London-based FCA-regulated digital asset exchange for institutional investors, in which asset manager Aberdeen became the largest external shareholder earlier this year. As always at Future of Finance, in addition to our panelists, we also have you, our audience, and all five of us encourage everybody watching or listening to submit questions and comments throughout this webinar by using the Q&A functionality at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Rest assured, I will not be saving those questions up to the end, but endeavor to get our panelists to address them as we go along so that everybody at this webinar can be an integral part of it right from the outset. I'd like to kick the discussion off by asking our panelists why they think fund managers will want to do fund tokenization. I've listed a minute or two ago some of the incentives to change in terms of lower costs, better investment performance, new types of investor, and so on. But of course, what finally inspires change in any market is some combination of fear as well as greed. Now, Brian, I guess that uh, you've been trying to persuade uh, fund managers and indeed have been supported by fund managers in developing the idea of tokenization. Why should fund managers tokenize their funds? What's the incentive for them to do that? Brian, you, you can hear me okay? Yes, Excellent. far away. Okay, great. I think some of the benefits that you mentioned earlier, um, if we summarize them around the, the you know, process the efficiency gains. I think it's a little bit of a um, almost a up there as a uh, something as a catalyst for change in this industry. Then uh, we'll probably find the, the 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 real drivers need to be around the and hand in hand with that the the increase in revenues. New customers. And then off the back of that, once we, we get the momentum behind tokenized assets being seen as a way of generating a, that benefit from that, we'll then see optimization and the mutualization of infrastructure, it's secondary benefit. But I think we, 
we need to leave with the the just being the customers and new types of products for customers. Mm -hmm. You're, you've been coming and going a bit there, Brian. Perhaps you keep your your uh, your mouth close to the microphone wherever it is in front of you would be would be would be helpful. But I, I understood understood you to say that there are real financial incentives for asset managers to act now, uh, and the mutualization of the infrastructure can come later. John, uh, you have been working with an investment association working group on developing the idea of tokenization. What conclusions have you reached about what the proper incentives are for asset managers to endorse tokenization? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the invitation to join this uh, very timely panel. I think um, I would agree with with many of the points that that Brian has made, but at a sort of strategic level, uh, we think that there is uh, a potential issue for investment firms to address here. I think that we've broadly spent the last 15 years or so since the financial crash um, dealing with a wave after wave of regulatory change uh, and as an industry haven't been able to been able to particularly uh, innovate in a number of areas and fund tokenization is potentially a way of um, radically changing and achieving some of the benefits of um, vast uh, technological advances in that period and what we really want to do although people are still extremely busy and the you know the regulatory um barrage continues um we would like to see um investment firms and the industry generally take forward some of these benefits both for the industry but also for the underlying um consumer and ensure that the industry is well positioned in the future because clearly there are you know uh rival um calls uh in terms of new and innovative products uh that consumers have the opportunity to invest into and the investment management industry needs to make sure it's still using uh um you know innovative and emerging technology uh in providing excellent service for consumers consumers whose expectations uh, and requirements have significantly changed um in recent years particularly as a result of the pandemic so uh, alongside Brian's sort of more more technical uh, explanations, I hope that provides uh, more of an industry incentive collectively as to how we need to try and take this forward. Mm, hi, uh, John. hi, Dominic. I was just going yeah, to add to ahead. that. Yeah, so thanks for having uh, thanks for having me here as well. I agree, it's a very timely panel. It's actually, um, I'd say, out of all of the groups of companies that we're talking to, the, the tokenization of funds seems to have captured the imagination of a lot of people. Because I think you have, um, you kind of have interest coming from both sides now. So obviously, there's, you know, people on this call and, and, and like us who are keen to see the digital world evolve. But actually, asset managers seem to be pretty incentivized. And and out of all of those, um, out of all of those potential clients that you have, that group seems most excited. And and for the two reasons, and I think we've covered them there obviously getting revenues up and getting costs down and to brian's point that kind of getting costs down and i think we're going to talk about some of them later you know the dated subscription redemption process transfer agency all of those all of those good things can absolutely be um improved but what they're what they're looking at right now is how do we increase revenue how do we distribute these products and how do we distribute them to a type of clientele which is more familiar with being up close to a market an eToro or a free trade you know investing completing a 12 page document to subscribe to a fund that you can redeem monthly isn't appealing to people nowadays and it won't be in the future being able to go directly to an exchange participate in these funds which are run by very credible managers but being able to get out is, is a great win for those great win for them and it also solves this liquidity mismatch problem that asset managers have as well how do i take a real estate fund with you know biannually annually uh, annual redemptions and offer that to retail uh, and that's what they want to do they want to penetrate these new segments and tokenization uh, is a way of doing that turning it into a new type of instrument and changing the way it trades john um i don't want to put words into your mouth but did i did i and i'm about to ask um david moffat a, a question which both you and, and and graham have brought up and brian as well uh, about getting those costs down uh, in other words, disintermediating certain of the service providers uh, around today. But did I hear you, John, say that you think there is an existential risk here for the asset management industry if it doesn't respond to this opportunity, it may get overtaken by some other type of entity? Essentially, yes. And and to extend Graham's point around 
uh, the sort of competing products that are out there that consumers are able to get access to. Um, that is very much the case. And what we need to make sure is that the fund industry isn't stuck in the 20th century as we approach um uh you know the a quarter of the of the 20 uh, of, of this century um through the pandemic we saw investor behavior shift quite dramatically uh, i think some of those trends have continued um and you know tokenized funds might not be the complete answer but i certainly feel it's part of the the answer as to how to move the industry forward you're getting some very interesting questions coming in, which I'll I'll put to you in just a second. But I'd like to 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 bring David into the conversation first. Uh, David, you heard what your fellow panelists said there. Brian mentioned mutualizing the infrastructure. Uh, Graham mentioned, you know, uh, actually excising some of the functions which the industry presently. Pay. Um, what what which intermediaries do you feel um and transfer agency the business you know and understand and work in very well yourself has often mentioned in this context who do you think is most at risk if the industry does move towards tokenization and and are some of those uh, incumbent intermediaries obstructing progress here or are they welcoming it that's an interesting one in this case Tommy thank you and let me echo the other panelists um gratitude for the opportunity to talk I, I work for an organization, as you rightly say, yes, as you see, where we're by far the largest transfer agent in the US, Canada, Luxembourg, Ireland, and here in the UK. So in a sense, we are we're probably most in the firing line at a certain level for people saying, look, is this going to radically excise cost and, and remove value chain players in this case? I mean, all I would say is that people have kind of signaled the death knell of transfer agency for the last 30 years since I've been in the industry. And, and lo and behold, every time we seem to emerge with greater importance within the overall value chain. So, um, I mean, our attitude is, is pretty clear cut to be honest. We will happily work with any and all technology improvements that will improve the efficiency of, 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 of the overall distribution of mutual funds in the industry as a whole. And that and that means we work with, for example, we work with Brian on the Fund Admin Chain um, Initiative. We are working with Calliston, the DMI Initiative. We're working with all funds and what they're doing. And at the end of the day, we are increasingly what we are doing in our blockchain development is developing open architecture nodes that allow other blockchain enabled providers to plug into us. So the, the question mark is that is there a massive level of cost that transfer agency or indeed other participants in the value chain represent that could be replaced and, and 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 how readily could you do those? Well, it's put it in context. I mean, the, on average across Europe, the average cost of transfer agency for a mutual fund is probably in the order of between one and a half and two basis points. So it's kind of equivalent to the, the cost of, probably about the cost of the fund accounting, um, it's broadly might be the same cost as the depository. Um, it's probably less by the time you account for it than all the costs attaching to custody. So it's one element of the overall servicing industry, but it's not it's not a massive game changer that's suddenly going to mean that fund managers' profitability concerns disappear because that's just not what it represents, to be honest. Mm -hmm. A lot, less, a lot less than the cost of distribution, I think, as well. Well, that that was the final point I was going to make in this case. And the, 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 the point which we have that we need to address is that there's lots of talk and there's lots of good ideas, and we're as fascinated as by anybody by what they might potentially represent as efficiency savings for us and for our clients. But the reality is, if you're using and deploying blockchain models within a closed loop of, of established known or pre-known industry institutional providers and you can create a liquidity for illiquid assets then i would be entirely in line with, with graham's thinking on this where the rubber hits the road and it kind of goes to the point of lisa's question on the on the list the reality is as soon as you take this more broadly and you actually need to hit the real world with concern for the regulator with the needs of conducting kyc and aml on parties who are not known to the blockchain at the outset, by the time you've done all the servicing and all the actual follow-up, you've got the capability to receive telephone calls from people who've got 
themselves locked into a loop and they can't manage to get themselves out of and need help, all of that means that in the middle of the sea, you're not losing an awful lot of cost, to be perfectly honest. I mean, the biggest thing that would make the biggest difference in our world is not around trading and, and, and the like, it's the settlement side. And I think, Dominic, I think your our hope is that we'll come and we'll talk about that. The ability to move to a genuine atomic settlement model is really critical because that would genuinely make a difference to cost. The rest of this, with every kind of respect to Graham and to Brian, it's really about opening up new markets and opening up new distribution channels more than it is about saving costs. Mm -hmm. and, and, and TA transfer agency is just one part of that. There are other players who might be challenged by it, but the reality is all of them will adapt and they will find a place in the value chain for, for tokenized funds as much as they do in the traditional world. Thanks, David. I'm old enough to remember fund platforms being the death star of, of transfer yes, agency 20, 20 years ago. Uh, I spoke last week to a startup which who believes that transfer agency, in particular the registration function, is actually the key to, to tokenization taking off. So I think views are views are changing. You mentioned Lisa's question. I'd like to, I'd like to bring that up and 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 I'll read it out. Um uh, uh Lisa Crotty's asked, I personally feel we hear a lot about the why. It'd be interesting to get more into the how. What are the first parts which need to move in order for tokenization industry to take off? And what are the key obstacles to be tackled in order for that to happen? Now, Brian, you're the logical person to, to answer that, probably followed by, by Graham, um, you, you, because you've been trying to you've been trying to make this happen um, for a while now. Uh, what, what's your answer to, to Lisa's question? Who, who should be the first movers? Should it be the government? Should it be the asset managers? Who should it be? Well, thanks, Tommy. I'm just going to come a little bit of bandwidth issues, hopefully that helps, if that's okay. So, yeah, you're, you're completely right. Just take been this very, mic. Very, been very open about it. I think uh, we, we were trying to have a cross-industry collaboration of all parts of the industry to see agreement that the business case holds in the, the mid to long term and near going to benefit from getting behind in the short term. It doesn't work like that. The reality is, for the reasons David said, uh, the, 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 the cost savings, as I said right at the outset, then we won't get very far. So how do we make this happen? I think that what we're seeing, other than trying to get the entire industry to adopt it, because let's face it, some fund managers may well be uh, more as a uh, a USP, and it's not something they're all going to try and do together. The team, they're going to see the economic value in, in, in adopting uh, and putting it heavily at the outset. So we're looking, we now realise that rather than trying to do it as a thing in collaboration, it's much better to identify some fund managers who genuinely how to leverage tokenized assets and DLT underneath that to get a value add, access new customers with a different product that they couldn't get before, and try to sell it to the same customers. There's no point in getting into the how do we do it. So that's doubling down, and we like to split this. We've got to split DLT and tokenized. To make the digital experience much better from an end customer, that doesn't actually talk about tokenized assets. So that's one of the hows. You make the end and the, the the value chain much more efficient. The point that Graham said, we found our document. Thing that's been done right now. Then there's the tokenized assets. It's those. I'm going to drive change rather than everybody doing it together. And my view is that we'll see less across the industry to see this production use cases come up. Once we start to get the with a smaller number of entities and we work together on the regulatory side, we'll come to do is once some fund managers have got a jump on their competitors, we know what will happen. The others will fall the fund managers demand then as david said earlier this isn't about removing a ta 
to drive further benefit in the operational efficiency model, but it comes next. So that's my edge cases with forward thinking, clever fund managers, new product, new customers, and in parallel, just basically adopting DLT, because guess what? Uh, in this way, is much more efficient than not doing it. Okay, Thank, thanks, Brian. If I, um, you came and went a bit there, but you were saying that it's better not to try and get a total industry collaborative project going, but to work with a group of committed fund managers who identify you know, use cases, make them work, and in the end, produce better and different products for, for the end investors. That's more important than than tokenization. That's your answer to to, to the Lisa Cotty question. Um, Graham, um, do you... Sorry, sorry, Tommy, I would like to just clarify. The, the, the collaboration across the industry is super important. And I think we, we keep going. We still want to have mutual benefit here. But the actual actionable production use cases are not going to happen when you've got 20 entities in a workshop. Right. Yeah. Okay. Graham, what's your, what's your perspective on, on Lisa's question? What's the how? How do we get to where we are, to where we want to be? Yeah, and um, yeah, Dominic, def definitely get to that. But just a bit of how how I think about things. Um, I'm an accountant as well, so ledgers are very close to my heart. And the way I think about all of this technology is just a ledger, and that's really important. Um, and we've never, from the start of our checks, I mean, we talk about disintermediation and improvement of efficiencies, but we've never been talking about removal of parties. And to David's point, our checks is actually working on a CSD in Luxembourg, which is purely digital. And the reason that we're doing that is because we think the CSD, which is kind of like a large transfer agent, the role doesn't change in the future. Oh, sorry, the role changes, but the need for the entity still exists. Someone still needs to verify people that come onto a chain someone still needs to verify those smart contracts someone still needs to maintain the integrity of the security and what better people to do it frankly than the current incumbents so you know i applaud companies like sssnc that are actually going okay ta is still going to be here how are we going to work with these new models because for sure they're still going to be needed to be there and if you look at companies like depositories as well they verify assets well over the last couple of weeks in crypto you know sure as hell everyone wants to be able to verify assets so these business models are going to change i don't think they're going to go away they might become more streamlined there might be new entrants but but they're still going to be there um and and within the total tokenized fund world i don't think anything more is needed we've got two projects right now both of them will be launched in q1 um there's probably about five or six asset managers around that who are still talking to us and the conversations to be honest the slowness is more you know these these are large companies with reputations and huge amounts under management. They all know they need to move in this direction, but they're obviously being cautious. They've got shareholders' reputations. You know, you know, they're speaking to their counterparts like their TAs to ask if they can support these new business models while still trying to innovate. From my point of view, this is a security. It's a fund. It's still on a ledger. It still has ownership. Everyone's still verified. It's still a fund in the jurisdiction. It was a fund in. It's distributed in the same way. Really nothing changes other than fund. Like for me, this is all about the TA. How do we show the representation of ownership? How do we put them on a blockchain? And um and I think the, the questions about what's holding us back uh, is, is you know, all around the regulatory legal status and a little bit around the blockchains as well. All of the action I see is on Ethereum, frankly. Um, you know, we're big fans of Hedera and Algorand and R3's Corda, uh, but you just don't get as much there. And the reason that you don't is that, you know, the crypto community has gone out and built on Ethereum. So everyone has a wallet. Everyone has a stable coin. It's just much easier to do POCs. But then when you try and create a tokenized fund at a regulated institution, suddenly, you know, you're starting to hit compliance issues. Even if you create a ward garden, is it a problem if you're paying gas fees where the beneficiaries of those gas fees may be people that participated in the IPO and, you know, never get their AML KYC? So you create all of these complex issues that hold it up. But from a legal structuring point of view, I mean, it's certainly possible in countries like Luxembourg, but I would argue it's even possible in the UK, the Channel Islands, Cayman Islands, and most countries where I see funds being set up. Okay, well, I'm 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 going to hold that thought about law and regulation. I'd like to come back to it, and, and David McGuinness, in fact, has answered, asked a question which is relevant to that. But I'd like to share with you this comment by um, one of our attendees on this point about customer due diligence. He says, "I was part of the team that launched the first mutual fund for retail participants, domicile in Cayman. Investors had to go through normal KYC AML checks before whitelisting their blockchain wallet." 
in which they can hold their fund shares and tokens. It's coded in the smart contract governing the fund that investors can only transfer fund tokens to other whitelisted blockchain wallets. The share register is therefore always known by the smart contract and shares can only be owned by investors who are, who are compliant. Now, it's like a combination of your, your walled garden. It's what, automated, it's what we do. Your automated customer due diligence, isn't it? Yeah, that's exactly that's exactly what we do. It's entirely the right solution. So, you know, put that put that into a current fund. Now, just imagine that that David and his team at SSNC, rather than emailing you for AML KYC, perhaps it goes through one of these many online portals that now exists. And one of the things you submit to them is a whitelist for is um sorry is your wallet address for the for the for the chain on which the token you're trying to purchase. You know, they they take that, they include it as part of your AML KYC documentation. Now they know they can deliver. The, the units into that wallet address and they know that you can't transfer them to people that they don't that they don't know and then you know and and, and again I know we're talking about stable coins and the like later but the ability to have cash and assets in that same wallet is hugely powerful especially when you think about things like distributing funds that may want to pay out to all of their holders rather than going out and gathering all of their bank details suddenly you know you have this verified address that the client's in and you can distribute directly to it. Now, David McGuinness asked this question, what do the panel see as the greatest barrier to adoption and the success of token assets? I've heard you say, Graham, that really, I, I think it's it's law and, and regulation. Um, John, I'm sure you have views on this, but David, perhaps w- would you would you agree that there are regulatory obstacles now to, to tokenization? When you look at all the reg- all the regulations you have to comply with, your clients, your fund management clients have to comply with, you know, CAS, USITS, AIFMD, uh, and in the US, of course, the 1940 Investment Company Act. So there are lots of regulations out there the original mutual fund industry has to comply with. And uh, those don't go away just because you start tokenizing things. Um, does law and regulation need to catch up uh, with the possibilities of tokenization? Well, it's it does it, but can it, to be perfectly honest? I think you have to draw a distinction here between vehicles which are aimed at purely institutional professional investors. They're... I think you can make the case for a a digital fund organization model relatively easily. You're dealing amongst grown-ups, so to speak, and and you can do that with a fairly fairly robust model in this case. And and you can definitely come up with a better, particularly a a mechanism that allows you to create a market in fundamentally illiquid underlying funds where the underlying assets are less liquid. You can create third-party arrangement in this case. One of the debates I'm sure we'll come to is, is it better to frankly tokenize the fund or is it better to tokenize the underlying assets? And John, I'm sure we'll have a view on that, given the desire to think for the industry in part to move to a much more personalized, even hyper-personalized model that, that, that we can see for the future. Um, but fundamentally, as soon as you take this into the retail environment, you've got a massive panoply of regulation and new securities bill going through Parliament as we speak, and we've got consumer duty requirements which are going to bubble up and and have yet to be fully defined. I think it's genuinely hard to to come up with a model which is not in the retail market, which is not going to have to actually conform to all of those regulations and conceivably more. And I think because of that, I think there's value here, but fundamentally it's going to need a lot of change. And it's not just legal and regulatory, it's operational. And it's about the fundamental mechanism by which you exchange money value. And to Graham's point, I think you can build as much as you like around Ethereum, but the institutional market nor the retail market for investors is ever going to use a cryptocurrency as a store of wealth other than the people who do it already because they're crypto bugs. But for the bulk, this really has needs either some kind of stable bank any stable coin come central bank issued token, or it's going to need movement in terms of other means of actually exchanging value other than through highly volatile cryptocurrencies. Maybe I can add to that, Dominic, if I may. Yes. I completely agree what David said there, and we've seen it firsthand some of the things we're working on. It's almost like right, right now we've got the We've got the challenge that the the, the 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 absolutely because it's on DLT doesn't stop it being an asset that needs to be regulated. But if we end up treating these digital assets in the same way, 
They then we end up coming back to them needing to be traded in a regulated exchange, still held in CSD. So we, we, we cut away some of the benefits that we can actually realise. But it gets worse than that if we're now getting caught up in the crypto regimes as well. So we've got the we've got to just work together the, the collaborations, but we, we need to move on what exactly should a digital asset uh, be regulated. So draw a line between what's happening in the crypto world versus what we're trying to do here. A second layer of unnecessary, in my view, regulations impact on what we're trying to do. John, um, I, I, I imagine as, as part of the work of your group, you've been looking at what other jurisdictions are doing. I'm hearing from David and to a lesser extent from Brian that the UK, despite being wanting to be in the forefront of, of, um, of innovation in financial services, doesn't seem to have done a particularly good job. David mentioned this, uh, this financial services and markets bill going through the, the House of Commons. I haven't read it that carefully, but I, I don't I, I, I'm not sure that it says anything specific about crypto assets in it yet. It says certainly says something about stable coins. So when you look at what the UK is doing and you compare it with what Luxembourg is doing and what uh, Luxembourg is very important, maybe what Ireland's doing, Liechtenstein, um, there's probably quite a long list of jurisdictions which are doing better than the UK in terms of uh, accelerating the tokenization of funds. Is that a reasonable comment to make, John? Yes, I think we need to bear in mind that there's a, a very large, a very wide spectrum on what tokenized funds actually are. Um, but certainly, we've seen uh, you know tokenized funds up and running in in many jurisdictions already. Most notably, the US. Uh, Luxembourg acted very quickly to clarify that there were no um, regulatory changes that the CSSF needed to make in order to implement this. Germany identified that there were some and then put in place a very comprehensive uh, set of legislation that came in um, earlier this year. Um, I would completely agree with Brian uh, from the point of view of uh, additional um, requirements in the UK jurisdiction that are being added on. There was um, uh, a recent um, uh, amendment to the Financial Services and Markets Bill, which um, provides the FCA with additional powers on crypto assets. And I think it is unfortunate that uh, a token in a fund, uh, in theory, would have uh, two layers of regulation applied to it, because um, funds are, are well established, have been for many years, very well established existing processes uh, around AML KYC in particular. Uh, and a whole uh, set of uh, different FCA handbooks on on the day-to-day -day operational uh, running and management of those yeah. funds. So we, so we uh, uh, it's it's on public record. We've been advocating for some time now that the the UK policymakers should uh, should work at pace to uh, implement a framework for tokenized funds to exist. Uh, it isn't really moving as fast as as we would like, but we are uh, very well familiar that the FCA is planning um, some substantial work on this in the future. So we're still hopeful that it's it's possible. Um, but there is the uh, the risk that the UK does start to fall behind on this as a subject. John, can I ask, do you, do you perceive a divergence between the attitude of H HM Treasury and some of the statements made earlier, in fairness under Sunak when he was Chancellor, and pre really the, the significant falls we've seen in some of the cryptocurrencies, which was very positive to try and set out London and, and the UK as being a stall for, for crypto assets. And I, I'm, I'm using their term. And the attitude now of the FCA, which seems, at least to us, to be much more conservative, much more about regulation, and much less about trying to set the stall out of London being the new home of every form of fund tokenization, tokenization generally, DLT, and every weird and wonderful crypto piece you ever want to see coming out. Is, is, is this just the difference of timing between the market as it was at the beginning of the year and how good it is now? Or is this a divergence between the two branches of the government, do you feel? Yes, there, there certainly has uh, it, there certainly is uh, a gap, I think, between, between the Treasury uh, and the FCA. 
Um, the uh, Treasury Minister, I think it was only yesterday, confirmed that they still wish to see the UK and London as a, as a crypto hub, which is very positive uh, from our perspective. But we're yet to see um, that sort of borne out in, uh, in in specific regulatory policy from the FCA. As I say, we're, we're aware that they are working on some uh, potentially helpful uh, interventions in the background and, and we hope that we'll be able to see those in the public domain very soon. But I think that obviously with the FCA's particular focus on consumer protection when it comes to crypto assets in particular, um, you know, that they, they have a, a different objective from 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 the UK Treasury uh, and necessarily, you know, there, there's therefore a different approach. Graham, is that is it just before we leave the subject of legal and regulatory uncertainty? Is this an issue you find when you're talking to people uh, that you would like to engage with with our track? So oh, it's too legal and regulatory uncertain for me to do anything. Once that's cleared up, I might talk to you again. Uh, no, I, you know, I'm I pretty much find that most law and regulation facilitates what we want to do because fundamentally if i just you know because we the problem is because we will talk about crypto and tokens it kind of almost forces everyone to think it needs something new but actually if you just think okay this is a security and instead of on a spreadsheet or a database the record of ownership is kept on this new technology if you start from there then 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 actually most of the regulation makes sense. So I, you know, I agree with the guys that it it's nonsensical to have these two layers of regulation. But the reason I think is because we haven't made anything new. Um, so if you take a broker in the UK that wants to come and trade on the Artax platform, they need to be on the crypto asset register if they're buying a digital security, even though they've already demonstrated that they that they can satisfy the AML KYC requirements. It's, you know, that bit of it is total lunacy to me. You know, if they were going to take control of it and shard private keys, fine. Maybe they maybe they need to be do something extra. But when you go through the regulatory application in the UK, you tick the instruments you want. I think cryptocurrency should be a new instrument. And if you tick it, you need to demonstrate a small bit of extra requirements, not go through the whole AML KYC again. And, and we were the first on the register. And we obviously did our MTF and the crypto asset application in parallel. Because in the UK, we're slightly different. If you do securities and their digital securities, your kind of Venn diagram, they overlap in the middle and you need to be regulated for both. But in the US, if they're digital securities, they're just securities. You don't need the crypto piece. And actually, that's more, more common around the world. Um, so I think that bit of our regulation needs some work. We should stop thinking of it as a new, a new instrument and we should just look to enhance what we have. And actually, from my point of view, um, the regulators... I mean, I kind of would say this because we got there, but the regulator's kind of been fair. I think the problem is that, you know, in all of this, you know, crypto asset is every instrument in the world, in my view. And so the crypto asset application program in, in, in included applications from companies doing all sorts of things. And this was a new team that's being built up. Some people are going there with complicated DeFi models with no real care for regulation other than knowing that they need it. And it just made the whole thing confusing. And, and the second anyone in that team gets any good, they get lifted by the companies that have a lot of money. So they got a real challenge on their hands there, the FCA. So, you know, actually, I, I think we're further ahead than most things. I actually think our problems are more, you know, baked into the into um, companies' law around whether ownership can genuinely exist on a ledger you know the kinds of things that the you know that the laws that the the, the the lawyers are looking at they're the things that i get more interested in can a token really be a security i actually think you know digital security on my venue you know all of the mtf rules all of the code of conduct rules all of the financial they're all exactly the same like most of it's right there so a fund is a security and the and the outstanding questions as far as you're concerned is how can i perfect ownership of this and if I if I can't perfect ownership of it, I can't transfer it to somebody else. Those yeah, fundamental questions of of company law or exactly, yeah, fund, like it's law. let's say it's a unit, so a unit in a fund. Artax has permission for units. If I create a token representing a unit, which would be common in the UK, in Luxembourg, the token can almost be the unit. But in the UK, let's say the token represents a unit. Well, there's a separate there's a separate security called a certificate representing a security. So is the token I've created now a security on its own? And now I've got two securities. Do I need a separate record of ownership? For like you end up with all these complicated questions. All we really want is, you know, if you just think fundamentally back to the ledger again, you've got a list of people that own this thing. There's a number next to them of how many they own. That's what we're all calling tokens. It's just an entry on a ledger. And I think, you know, the more we talk about tokens and crypto, with the more we're giving this name to an instrument, but really it's just a value, really it's just a value of who owns the instrument. It tends not to be the instrument itself. But funds are distributed in more than one country. 
So yes. which, do you not have to decide which law applies to the contract between the buyer and the seller? Yeah, I mean, this is where it gets incredibly complicated, especially for us. So, you know, if we just take an example, um, so in the UK for our venue, if we want, to, so there, there are two things, firstly, primary market and secondary market. So raising money for funds and secondary market trading of funds. So primary market, you're kind of looking into the prospectus regime, distribution, financial promotions, you know, which jurisdictions can you passport into? How is the token viewed into it? You're like, you've got all of those. And then when you get to the secondary market, it gets even more complicated because you're starting to say, okay if it's trading on a um if it's trading on a uh, on a trading venue then actually we need to register these in crest in the uk or via some sort of depository agreement if it's a foreign jurisdiction so then you end up with the complicated traditional layers combined with a total like it becomes a it becomes a mess pretty quickly so you know harmonization across you know you know we've got if we've got this new way of thinking about everything it would be helpful if the regulators tried to get together to think of how to deal with it and actually if it became more globally transferable because i think that's one of the things that crypto had is the fact this thing could be pinged around the planet and traded by everyone if we could have the same with um with securities you know we would we would be in a great place the reality is for everyone saying what smart contracts can do i know i think David said it earlier, like we can all talk about, well, let's just embed regulation into the smart contract. Like that's such a difficult task. Like it's hard enough for me to sit here and work out sometimes if someone's an elected professional or not. Trying to program those variables for my jurisdiction into a computer program is difficult enough. Trying to do that globally when everything's changing is practically impossible. So it, you know, it's never going to be as globally transferable as crypto, but I think everyone could work together to make it a bit more transferable. Um, Henry Rasson raises this question. Is there scope for tokenization to improve cross-border fund distribution, particularly with respect to investor protection and large time zone differences? I, I think Henry is asking here an operational question rather than a um a regulatory or legal question, which we've just we've just dealt with. Um, um David, uh distribution is your business. Yeah. Is is there do you, have you explored the question of whether tokenization can help? Uh, with with cross border, just to clarify, distribution support is our business. We don't distribute okay. in our own name. But leaving that legalistic difference aside, I think the answer has to be yes. And and certainly the point I think that Henry makes about the time zone differences is, is a relevant one in the sense that it, it, I mean it, it is if you think about it it's somewhat bizarre that the predominant legal codes the of funds distributed in Asia, for example, which is obviously where we get the largest time zone differences are largely those formulated in the context of the European law and, 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 and governed by a regulator in a small duchy just south of Belgium. I mean, that's a, you'd never have predicted that, to be perfectly honest. And one of the issues that becoming is becoming an increasing issue is, understandably, Asian asset allocators and decision makers are saying, I don't want to have to make decisions and commit trade instructions by the close of business my time when it's conceivably going to be another 10 or 12 hours before those are enacted and priced in the market because of the valuation point of the fund. If there is a way that you can create either a secondary market or you can have free floating valuation points on the underlying portfolio, and this is this is really going to the heart of some of the stuff that John has done within the IA, so that you actually end up with personalized portfolios and personalized valuation points. That, I think, is where you're talking about radically changing the nature of distribution. And that then plays to Graham's point about how do you address the expectations of younger investors who have grown up, just as he rightly says, using the likes of eToro and other trading solutions, who want immediate gratification, immediate completion of trade instructions now. I, they want to meet the trade instruction, they want to settle that now, atomically, and they wish to hold title now at this particular point in time to the underlying assets within the security. That, that I think, is how you address the real point or a cross-border distribution. But the problem you're then going to get is, of course, the real-world regulators intervening in this case and wanting to have particular different variants of regulation that relates to each of the elements of that process and they want to control that locally, and that could be a problem in its own right. And if we're reliant on the secondary market to value funds, that doesn't sound like good news for, for fund accountants. You're going to replace that once a day NAV calculation with 
Well, they're, they're, funny counters will still have to create and, and establish a genuine nav at some point during the day as the basis for say, anybody offering a third part, if you like, a secondary market on a third party basis. So the, the reality is they'll still need to do as much as they're doing. I but, your Asian, but your Asian distributor could still commit to that secondary market price and be prepared to wait 10 hours for it to settle. Or, or they could commit to it and agree a price with a third party today, right now, and then that would then be squared off. So somebody effectively is making a market, so to speak, in a way that right now they don't have available to them. And mm -hmm. the ledger for that has been maintained and settled off the DLT model, fund tokenized model. Okay, well, that's a very substantial substantial benefit. Um, I, I'd like to, to move on. We're into our last 15 minutes now. I'd like to, to move on to something you raised, um, David. You also raised it. Um, I think John and maybe you all raised it, which is this question of getting cash onto onto the ledger um, to achieve atomic settlements. This is one thing a government could do. It could issue a central bank digital currency and make it available for people to use in their in their digital wallets. Is this the magic bullet? Which um, if you if you John perhaps could and Brian, I'm sure you'd want to chip in on this. If you could give one measure to Her Majesty's government to transform the the tokenization scene in London, would it be give us a digital pound sterling? Well, that would absolutely help, Dominic. Um, you know, uh, there are, well, let's, let's take a step back. So in, in most of the other jurisdictions I've mentioned, cash isn't part of the, uh, of the transaction on chain. So you can uh, do the subscription and the redemption, but the, the cash usually follows in, in the, in the, the way that we're familiar with. Uh, mm -hmm. at the moment uh and the alternatives are use of stable coins um some of which uh you know haven't had a good press uh this year for obvious reasons so a central bank digital currency which everyone can get behind would would certainly help and we're expecting something fairly soon from the uh from the bank of england on on that subject um which for various reasons tokenized funds um included we hope uh is going to be progressed uh fairly quickly because it's an option opportunity for for the uk to really take a lead mm -hmm. ryan do you want to do you want to chip in on that I, I was wondering here whether perhaps asset managers themselves should issue a stable coin it'd be something they could do to get the market moving provide a you know a stopgap solution at least before we get a, a sterling cbdc anyway just a thought brian how important is having cash on ledger to the success of what you're trying to do? Yeah, well, more, more generally, I think, as, as, as just to agree with John, if you get the, you know, if you get the, the payment rails and the, the asset rails onto the same ledger, of course, we can we can move towards uh, where, where it's desired, atomic settlement, immediate settlement, or quicker settlement. And that in turn's got two two benefits. One is it does trigger a lot of the operational efficiencies that without that in place you can't really achieve. But it also gives you the opportunity to look at uh, coming back full circle, different uh, product types. So I think it's, it's critical to really uh, not not just what we're doing. And just to be clear here, what we're doing, as I said earlier, is a lot of what we're doing is just using DLT to drive more efficiency through things like onboarding. But on the actual tokenized asset side, yeah, it's pretty linchpin to seeing this going to the, uh, to, to the benefits we're all talking about. And in terms of, but I think in terms of issuing a stable coin, you've got to really ask why, what, what, what's the reason for that? What's the value add? And why should a fund manager do that as a stopgap to the, the, the uh, CBDC coming along? I'm not quite convinced that there would be a clear enough answer for the fund manager to issue a stable coin for this reason. I'm interested in anybody else's view, David. Yeah, I think, I mean, let's put this in context. Um, almost where we started was how how does essentially a fund tokenized model improve the efficiency of distribution and, and the whole process of buying and selling units? In the current world, we receive on our side in the UK, 99.6% of all the trade instructions we receive come electronically already, largely over Calston or... Uh, you're a clear, clear stream, whatever in this case. Um, some come through our own digital front ends, but 
almost all of our trading is now done electronically. There's very little by way of telephone or God help us paper-based instructions now. The issue that causes the most amount of pain and employs significant hundreds of staff in our business is about moving money. It's about the trading process, it's about settlement, it's about the occasional non-settlement, um, it's about cash and protection of client monies, making sure all the right money literally to the penny is in the right bank accounts at all points during the working day and all the bit that goes with it. And that has been, I mean, that is a really painful grinding process. A model that allows you to do true electronic settlement, true DVP, I, I place the trade and I receive the value of the units and I pay for them in picoseconds on a non-reputable basis is enormously appealing from our viewpoint. The problem is that I think, well, what we've seen is that stablecoin this year have been frankly anything but. They're underpinned, they were never really public about it, but it appeared that the actual amount of liquidity in the real fiat currency they held was what, Graham, you probably know better than I, but between one and 2% of the, the theoretical issued value of the stablecoin. I mean, frankly, they were a Ponzi scheme waiting to happen. It was rubbish. And to be honest, I think, John, the problem is that I think the central banks themselves are getting nervous about the loss of control of the money supply and the ability for central bank depository coins to be used for less than ideal purposes, i.e. terrorist financing, money laundering, and everything else, which is why I think the pace on this between the Feds, the Bank of England, and everything else has slowed down. Now, to your point, Dominic, in this case, do I think ultimately fund managers should issue their own stable coin? No, not less prepared to put up very large sums of money, literally on a pound for pound, dollar by dollar basis to make it a true stable coin, which most of them aren't ever going to It's not, it's not that far away from a money market fund, is it? Well, that's the point I was going to make. Some of the work that's now going taking place in the States, in particular, Ernst & Young, Ian Y are, are at the forefront of this, of effectively creating a tokenized version of a stable money market fund, i.e. one that's always priced, it's open-ended, it's always priced at a dollar, let's say in their context. And that you then buy and hold a repository of wealth in that stable coin as your, your safe haven. And when you want to get money with that fund manager, you move, in effect, you're conducting what effectively amounts to a switch instruction, but that's done on an atomic settlement basis. And that then moves the money back and forth accordingly. That I think has got some real legs to be honest. So not a stable coin in fairness, and, and not the kind of model that, would replicate that, but it would, on a one-to-one -one basis, create a genuine repository of cash against something which could then be settled and could be used in electronic. Does, does this help explain why you would support tokenizing the underlying assets as well? Uh, I, I think, well, I think there's a lot, of, a lot of case. I mean, people make a lot of case for illiquid assets being traded through a mutual fund, which has, has got, if you like, a secondary market to it. The problem is about opacity at that point. To my mind, every time I hear people talk about that, my immediate reaction, would it not make more sense to actually tokenize the underlying security, the underlying building, the underlying asset, and have that as a tradable entity within the mutual fund rather than actually tokenizing the mutual fund itself? Um, debate. I don't think there's any absolute answer to that, but it, it seems to me that might be a, a way of greater transparency. Um, John, do you does your group support that idea, tokenizing the underlying assets? And I'm talking here of bonds and shares as well as real estate, anything. Yes, absolutely. And there's been huge strides made on the bond market recently. Um, several sort of experiments and, and live tests have happened uh, on bond issuance uh, over the past year to 18 months. That's all gone very, very smoothly. As you say, we'd like to see it across all asset classes. Um, but obviously that's a huge task. So to answer David's question, I think um, in terms of an implementation timescale, tokenized funds would probably be uh, an easier, uh, albeit what we've already discussed uh, through today and some of the challenges. Um, but, you know, if you're talking about tokenizing all asset class in the, in the investable universe, they would each have their own uh, different ways of, um, of being traded and, and custodied. 
you know, it, that's, that's a huge task. So I think mean, one one step at a time, but absolutely, we'd love to see, for example, a tokenized fund holding uh, native digital assets, illiquid assets, uh, or, or just, um, you know, tokenized uh, mainstream assets. Mm -hmm. Now we're into our last five minutes, so I'd, I'd, I'd like to get a, perhaps a thought from, from each of you in those last few minutes. Uh, go back to Lisa Crotty's question, which is such a good one. We've talked so much about the why, wasn't this a great idea, and much less about, about the how. And you can answer this question any, any way you like, but I was thinking one way to approach it is to say we've got this existing, very successful mutual fund industry. It's worth 70 odd billion trillion uh, around the world. Are we looking with tokenization to try and migrate that industry into a tokenized form? And I'm, I'm not sure how we would do that, maybe add a tokenized share class or whatever. Or are we looking to grow alongside that established, existing incumbent industry, a whole new way of doing things, which becomes so persuasive that every issuer and fund managers will be issuers of, of funds, are issuers of funds, that they think, well, we must go down that, that path as well. So is this about migration or about building a parallel uh, industry? What do you, Brian, what do you think you're doing at FAC? Is this a parallel product or a, a replacement? We're, it's a blend for us. So we're doing, we're, again, I'll make this split because it is important. We're leveraging DLT to make the digital end-to-end -end experience for investors and for the managers easier, better. That's leveraging DLT. So that's, but we're let, we're building the, the underlying technology to be able to cater for traditional assets and tokenized assets. So it's a slow burn in terms of changing the current state into DLT. But in parallel with that, we're working in pockets of edge cases of fund managers who are seeing that they can generate flow and generate revenue through tokenized funds. So for us, we're going to blend both together. We will then bring those early use cases onto our digital end-to-end -end, and then when the market starts to pick up and that becomes a norm, then we've already got a new aged technical architect that caters for traditional and for tokenized. So we, we, we've came to the conclusion some time ago that we have to do both. And those edge cases would be what? Edge funds, private equity? Um, we're working on both. We're working on uh, obviously this or uh, under NDA. We're working the pri the private markets with uh, several fund managers and uh, on on uh, more recently on the, the mutual side as well. Um, Graham, what, what's your what's your thought about this question? Are we talking about um, replacement or 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 um, or, or coexistence? The Aberdeen's invested in in our checks. They must have <laughs> their fund business somewhat in mind as they as they've done that. Yeah, I think um, well, I think at the, in the short term, then they're going to coexist. I think you, um, I'm more for creating digital share classes. I think you create, uh, sorry, digital um, feeder funds rather than the the share classes, just to create the um, <clears throat> the legal segregation. I think that will be important for existing shareholders. I think you um, you create an entirely new digital feeder that's a new offering to a new type of client that perhaps you couldn't get to before. Um, and then um, and then you kind of reach out to a new market and go, hey, you can invest same fees, potentially more liquidity and all, you know, all these other benefits coming and you probably get some new investors, but you might see a migration of existing, existing clients over as well. So I think they coexist for a while, but I genuinely think over the next five, 10 years, we're seeing a, mi a migration of all assets onto this technology. So I know we were talking about the underlying or the funds just now you know i think of them as the same they're assets they need a ledger they've got ownership everything's moving on chain so i think in the short term we'll create these digital feeders in the fullness of time a rational consumer would go somewhere with better liquidity same fees and then that, and over time we'll we'll start to see them all come together but i think where you end up is with asset managers with more assets under management because you'll be tapping in you know you'll be satisfying these new users that david and i have talked about that you weren't able to 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 previously satisfy but operationally you will end up with two registers then you know two share classes in the same or two types of share in the same fund who's going to reconcile those your csd or david well, no, transfer agent? well at the moment you you know you 
quite commonly have a master with multiple feeders and you have a register for the master and a register for the separate feeders you know whether you whether you, if you just add another digital feeder and it's on its own that's not really a big deal at all i don't think it i don't think that's going to matter i think the work is on the transfer agency side on boarding these new clients um and then in the fullness of time i think they will migrate that way i, I think that's a a relatively little amount of work and like david was saying cost basis points at the moment um for the extra revenue it will be bringing in for the asset managers mm -hmm. david i know you've got to go in a minute so give us a give us a thought on that uh, um graham's outlined an opportunity for, for ta in this process of coexistence and gradual migration is that how you see it i, I think that's probably about right um I mean, to disclose an interest in the sense, Graham and I share a client in Aberdeen, and that we maintain the, the current old world register on their behalf. And uh, and I'm sure, given their equity stake, they see Ajax as being the future for elements of that. I mean, there, there's what? There's 35,000 mutual funds in Europe, just under 4,000 in the UK. Um, to suggest that in some sense we're going to replicate even a significant, or even a minority of those. You want to talk about what would add massive levels of cost to the asset management industry is replicating a whole pile of new portfolios with all the, the attendant middle office requirements, all the bit around analysts and fund managers. I mean, you're talking about break the bank stuff at that point. So I think they will need to read and they will coexist probably in perpetuity, to be honest. I think an increasing proportion will find some way of also being serviced through an RJAC style model in this case, in terms of trading through a blockchain model. I think the one area that you will see is a lot of vehicles, I'll take that back. I think you'll see a number of vehicles launched focusing on less liquid asset types outside of the kind of the LTAF, the LTIF model that we see in Europe, um, through the likes of that which Brian is describing to deal with. We're fundamentally private equity, private bond, less liquid, conceivably some innovative stuff in the property sector. That I think will see new vehicles launched and they will only conceivably be launched because of the ability to create a secondary market. They will only be launched with, in effect, fund DLT style models to them. They will not have a representation within the traditional old style world. Thanks, David. A last word from, from you, John. It's a rather un, you know, unlucky position to be in because you've heard what everyone else has to say, but it's what I've been hearing is that there, there isn't going to be a big bang here. It's going to be a, a long period of coexistence with most of the, the tokenization experiments taking place from what I might call alternative asset classes, infrastructure, private equity, hedge funds, real estate, to bring those to new types of in, investors and the industry will gradually migrate over time. Is that the sort of vibe that is coming out of the group that you're you're working with is that a realistic scenario for the future yes i would agree with that and not not too much to add really i think uh from a regulatory perspective i think there is some um attraction in having a segregated model so if you've got uh, a feeder fund that has segregated um its uh its assets and its uh, operations from from the mainstream fund i think that would be uh, attractive from a regulatory perspective for at least the first step um but to david's point there's a, there's always going to be a rump i mean we're still dealing with operational issues from 15 20 years ago when rules change so um it's uh, uh you know and, and for such a significant um infrastructure change as this then clearly it's going to there'll be a, a parallel running for many years to come and with that, I think we must uh, sadly stop. We could clearly talk about this for, for a very long time indeed. I'd like to thank our panellists, uh, John Allen from the Investment Association, Brian McNulty from FAC, uh, David Moffat from SSNC, and Graham Rodford from Archax. And thank you also to you, members of our audience, for your questions uh, and your comments. Here at Future of Finance, our next event takes place a week tomorrow. It's on a subject made highly topical, I think, by the uh, recent collapse of FTX uh, which is digital asset custody. So do join us if you can for the changeable burden that regulation is about to lay on digital asset custodians at 1400 London time here on Zoom next Thursday, the 8th of December. But for now, it's goodbye from the five of us. Mm -hmm.